Hi, I want to welcome you to another Friday Night Live Bible Study. This is Pastor Richard Stewart, and we're going to spend the next hour studying God's Word. I like calling this Friday Night Live because that's what this is. Friday Night Live. A time that we set aside to study God's Word. We uh, used to go out on Friday nights thinking we were having a good time, sometimes actually having a good time, but there wasn't anything lasting. What we're doing now is spending some time in the Word of God, and I know that this will last. I'm excited about what we're going to share tonight. The Holy Spirit always alerts me as to where we're going. I don't go there exactly as it is in our notes, but we go where He leads us to go, and that's the important thing. He knows who's watching. He knows who's going to hear this in the future even. And so what we want to do is we want to minister in accordance with his leading and his guidance. What we're going to do is we're going to get started this evening with uh, prayer. And we're going to pray this evening in accordance with the word of God concerning wisdom. You know, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 30, it says that God has made Jesus to be wisdom for us. And so in praying for wisdom, we're going to do that according to the word where we receive Jesus. If we receive Jesus, we receive the wisdom. And we want to do this at the start of the program because the word of God in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, says that the word of God is spiritually discerned. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says the natural man can't receive the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. And so we want to make sure that if you're watching, that you have every opportunity to be blessed through receiving this word. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to I'm going to ask you to pause just for a moment with me, and then we'll be right back with you. Okay. We're back. I want to thank you for your patience. What we're going to do now is pray as we said before. What we're going to do is we're going to pray Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. So if you'll follow after me. God, God I, come to you. I come to you. I come to you according to your word. I come to you according to your word. Your word says, your word says in the book of Romans, in the book of Romans chapter, 10, chapter 10, verse 9, verse 9 that, if I will confess with my mouth, that if I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart, in my heart that, you Jesus from the dead, that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I shall be saved. I shall be saved. God, God, right now, right now with, my mouth, with my mouth, I confess, I confess that, Jesus that Jesus is Lord. Is Lord. And I believe, I believe in my heart, in my heart that, you that you raised Jesus from the dead. From the dead. So, according to your word, so according to your word, with my mouth, with my mouth I've, made a confession I've made a confession unto salvation. Unto salvation. And with my heart, and with my heart I, have I have believed unto right standing. Unto right standing with you. with you. For your word says, your word says that, whosoever that whosoever calls upon, calls upon the, name the, the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. And right now, right now I'm, calling I'm calling on the name of Jesus, on the name of Jesus for, my for my salvation. So I thank you, Father, thank you, Father that, I that I shall be saved. And I thank you, I thank you in, the in the name of my Lord, of my, Lord my, God, my God, my Savior, my Savior and my King, and my King Jesus. Jesus. The Christ. the Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Holy Spirit, we thank you for leading us and guiding us in this study so that we, your children, will be edified, exhorted, we will be comforted, and our walk with the Lord will be the better for the time we spent with you following your leading and studying the Word of God. Now, for those of you that have downloaded the study notes, I want you to turn to page 13. And we're going to start in Romans chapter 1. I believe your study notes starts with verse 17, but I'm going to start reading in verse 16, and then we'll go to 17 through 20. Verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, good news of Christ, for it is God's power working unto salvation, for deliverance from eternal death, 
to everyone who believes with a personal trust and confident surrender and firm reliance to the Jews first and also to the Greek. Well, we'd say today to the Jews first and also to the Gentile believers. It goes on in Romans 1 verse 17, it says, For in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed through the way of faith that arouses to more faith. As it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. Now we're going to break these down and explain these as we go through the study. But right now, let's just go through the scriptures and we're going to focus on one particular part. Verse 18 says, <clears throat> For God's holy wrath and indignation is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness repress and hinder the truth and make it inoperative. Now, family, this is so important for us to take these words and look at the impact of them and look at the real meaning of them. what's being said here. God has just told us and revealed that there are some people that their whole intention is to hinder the truth and make God's word inactive in your life. Now, this isn't a fairy tale. These people exist. And as you grow and mature in the things of God, you don't want them making the word inoperative in your life. And that's why we study to learn the truth and to get God's word active in our lives. It goes on to say in verse 19, For that which is known about God is evident to them and made plain in their inner consciousness, because God himself has shown it unto them. Now remember, this is in your Bible. This isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a short novel. This is the word of God. And God is telling you that there are people that he has made the truth known to. He knows that they know the truth. And he said, they're acting in your life. They want to act in your life. Let me put it that way. To keep the word inoperative in your life so that the power of the word of God is never realized by you in your life. That's their whole purpose. That's what they're doing this for. In verse 20, listen to this. This is so crucial. It says, for since the creation of the world, how long has this been going on? Since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is, his eternal power and divinity, have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the things which have been made, his handiwork. So men are without excuse, altogether without any defense or justification. No man can ever come to God and says, you kept this secret. We had no idea what you did for us. He said he's made, he's taken away that as a defense. The only defense that we have once we learn this and we come into the knowledge of these truths is what we were sharing last week and that there are some people that are willfully ignorant. He said, that's not an excuse. He says, you're without an excuse. He said, I've made this so plain to you that you can look at the creation and know that there is a God. And this is the God that is speaking to you right now through his word. I want to share, share a couple of things with you about this creation that I find just completely astounding, almost overwhelming in just one aspect of the creation. I'm going to give you some numbers to give you an idea of this God that we're talking about. 
the magnitude of this God, the power of this God, the, the magnificence of this God, the God of the Bible, the God that's your heavenly father, the God that's your savior, the God that's your counselor, the God that wants to be so close to you that he places you in his son so that he can love you throughout all of eternity. Listen to these figures. We're talking about the creation. He's the creator of the world. And it says, uh, one of the things it says, our sun, one that was shining today so nicely here in Southern California, is one of about 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Let me say that again. One of about, the reason I say about, because the astronomers, they're estimating that there's actually more than 200 billion stars, like our sun. And our sun is not a particularly large one, star. 200 billion. In this one galaxy, we're talking about God. And I want you to see how God does things through his word, through his creation. What he just said, we can look at the creation and know that there is a God. Now, we call this the Milky Way galaxy. Now, when you go to the scientists, they believe that there's approximately, listen to these numbers, two trillion, I didn't say billion, two trillion galaxies like the Milky Way galaxy in the part of the sky that we can observe. Not with our naked eye. This is with our most powerful telescopes and the ones out in space. That they call it the observable universe. What we can observe of the universe, they believe to be contain two trillion galaxies. Now, that that seems like it was was that seems like a lot. They figure those two trillion galaxies cover about 93 billion light years that we can see. We're talking about some huge numbers, but we're talking about a big God, one that can take care of us. If he can handle this, he can take care of us. He says, look at the universe and you will know from looking at the universe that there is a God. Now, I don't want to stop here because I want you to know the magnificence of our God. We're talking about two billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And then we're talking about two trillion galaxies like the Milky Way in the part of the sky that we can see. That's called the observable universe. Now, here is what it just really is just astounding. These two these two trillion galaxies in the part of the universe that we can see is contained in only 4% of the universe. In other words, when you see something that says the observable universe that has two trillion galaxies in it, you're only talking about 4% of the visible universe. Now, what's in the other 96%? The number of galaxies alone, they're probably innumerable. 200 trillion galaxies and 4% of the observable universe? He says, oh man, you're without excuse. It's no excuse for this, for not believing in a God. Now he created the universe. Now let's look at the creator. In John's gospel, chapter one, verse three, it says, all things were made by him 
and without him was not anything made that was made. The Lord Jesus, that's, that's the him that this is speaking of, the living word, made all things. Not only the 4%, he made the other 96% that we can't even see. They were made by him. And it says, without him, there was not anything made that was made. Now, see, if we start to get uh, an idea of the magnitude of the power of our God, we'll stop thinking that he couldn't make us a new leg or a new arm or a new heart or, or uh, make us a car or make us a house or make us something that these things are so trivial in comparison in size and in scope as to what the Lord has already made that is innumerable. I mean, when you, if, if you go from the gross and start breaking it down to the, to the minute, to the very smallest of things, the atoms and the electrons and things, how many, it's innumerable. What a God we have. Let's read some more scripture in Ephesians chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 6. It says, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, this is going to show us, if you follow along with these scriptures, God's purpose for creating you. We can see the magnitude of what he's created in the physical universe. And then he placed you in the universe and he created you with a purpose. And the people that hold these truths, it says in unrighteousness there in the first chapter of Romans, they don't want you to ever even start to imagine the power and scope and majesty of our God. Because then they will never be able to keep you, hold you captive to stuff to things when you start to know your savior who created all of this stuff now let's see let's go on and see why he created these things this is so awesome church hey i know it's probably for some that's probably the first time you heard anyone going this deep into god's word and his purpose for your existence but you'll never say you didn't hear it because the word is going to tell it to you right now Verse 7, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Your Lord and Savior is so rich, it just says you can't even calculate, start to calculate his wealth. He owns all of this. What you can see and what you can't see. But we're over here to see what your purpose was in this whole creation. It says in verse 9, And to make all men see. How many men? All men. That includes you. Don't try to escape out of this. We're talking about preachers are talking about this one or that one. No, it's talking about you. To make you see. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Is that plain enough for you? He created all things by who? By Jesus Christ. It says, and this is given to you, this scriptures are given to you so that you would know this mystery that's been hid in God from the beginning. And it's God's Son, the Lord Jesus, who created all things. Verse 10, it says, to the intent. We're going to read that also at that verse 10 in the Amplified Bible. But it says to the intent, it says this is the reason why he did it. This is what he's telling you right now. Why did he create all of this stuff that we talked about? And there are things that we don't even start to know that he's created. 
It says, to the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Come on, church, this is, this, this is something worth meditating on. This, that we're talking about your prayer life. Whether you really, you want to hold on to what we're talking about and why we're sharing this. Because there are people that don't want you to know this. That's the people we read about over there in, in chapter 1 of the book of Romans. They don't want you to ever start to even aspire to know, to, to know the truth of God's word. The depth of God's word. The lengths that God went to. To, to create you and to, to send his son to save you. See, this is knowledge hidden from men for generations. But the word says it's now, but now, now, today, this day, it's being revealed to you. Why? Because God wants you to know and he has something he wants you to do. And he's telling you, if you close your eyes to this, if you close your mind to this, he says, you're without excuse. You can't even close your eyes and deny this. And then say, well, I didn't know. You can't close your ears and say, I didn't know. He says, you're without excuse. He says, you can look at an ant and know there's a God. Look at a little weed, a little tiny flower. Just go walk down the street and look at the cracks in the sidewalk and you see a weed and it has a little tiny flower. And you pick it up and you put it under a magnifying glass and that little flower has brilliant colors and patterns that we can't even duplicate. Just a little tiny flower on a weed and you can know that there's a God. Let me finish reading this. This is your purpose. In verse 10, it says, To the intent, here again, that's the purpose that now unto principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the wisdom of God. You know, in Ephesians, we read about, uh, what is it there in Ephesians 6, where we war not against flesh and blood, but against powers, thrones, principalities, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places. We usually hear about that because we hear so many sermons on sin. And that's usually what that's dealing with us fighting sin and so we hear it over and over and over again but what about the majesty what's up with these powers and principalities and thrones we don't even know who they are we don't even know what they are but one thing we know is that they are because the word tells us that we war against them but evidently not against all of them because here it's talking about those same powers and principalities and thrones in heavenly places. Listen to this. It says, verse 10 again, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, that's us, that's you, that's me, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a purpose for God doing this. He says it's an eternal purpose. It's never going to end. That he's going to do something through the church that's going to show something to these powers, thrones, principalities, and heavenly places. Through you. Through me. Through us as a body. The body of Christ through the church. Now what is it that this is what is it that this is going to do? In verse 10, I want to read that again in the amplified Bible. It says, the purpose is that through the church the complicated many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, principalities, and powers in the heavenly sphere. Let's look at this for just a second. Let's just take a moment and look at this. There are some entities, powers, thrones, principalities, the Word of God calls them, 
that are in heavenly places, not in this physical universe that we started talking about. So they can see everything from their heavenly places. They can see everything in the physical realm that God has created. All of the things we talked about, the expanse of the universe, they are not inside of this physical universe. They're in the spiritual arena and they're looking at this spiritual, this physical universe that God created in and through Christ Jesus. And everything that we see in the magnificence of what God has created does not show these powers, thrones, principalities in the heavenly sphere, does not show how wise God is. In fact, I didn't say that properly. They don't show the scope of God's, not wisdom, but wisdoms with an S. If, if when you read this and you say, wait, wait, wait what, what is this saying? The purpose is that through the church, the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all its infinite variety and innumerable aspects, the wisdom of God, uh, infinite wisdom. Now, no, I didn't say that correctly. The infinite wisdoms with an S with an infinite number of, of aspects of each one of the infinite wisdoms. And you say, well, well, that's beyond anything that your mind can conceive. What I want you to see is that everything God created does not show the principalities, the powers, the spiritual entities in the heavenly places. They do not, everything he's created cannot show these entities God's infinite wisdoms, but you do. What is man? You see where the psalmist back in, what was it, the eighth psalm, when he was just, just meditating, looking up at the sky, and he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you would visit him? And if you look back to the psalms, if you look to the 19th Psalm, it says in the first verse, I believe it is, that the firmament, that's the space, the universe, it says the firmament itself shows forth the glory of God. And if you look up that word firmament, it's in the scriptures multiple times. And what does it do? What does the firmament do? It shows forth the glory of God, but not like you do. See, church, we're living far beneath, far beneath what God created us to do. We're, you know, we're, we're thinking in terms of the ancient ones that knelt on rice trying to beseech the Lord and would cut themselves and flog themselves and they would put themselves in monasteries and would quit talking and would do all kind of bizarre stuff. It was bizarre to me. And here in God's word, the same word that they had, God is saying, I didn't create you to humble you. He said, I created you to show forth my glory. A glory that can be seen in the very firmament, the very expanse of the universe, but can't be explained the way you can, the way I can, the way we can as a church. Oh, yes, you know, I never heard any stuff like this. I know you haven't. The reason you haven't is that for centuries this has been kept secret by people that the Lord said in Romans 1, he has shown it to them. And they've kept it secret so that you wouldn't know the magnitude of who you are and what you are in Christ Jesus. Now I want us to go on and look at some more scripture. I'm talking about, if you haven't understood yet, or if I haven't made it plain yet, I'm talking about prayer. I'm talking about our ability as the children of God 
to get things manifested in our lives, they give glory to God and accomplish a portion of what he created us to do. And that was to take this gospel, this good news that you're receiving right now into all the world. But if you won't receive it, if I won't receive it, if we won't receive it, if we won't share it, we can't trust the ones that he's shown it to previously to share it because it says right there in Romans 1, it says they hold the truth in unrighteousness. He said, and I know they hold it on, in unrighteousness. They don't share it. He says, how do I know they have it? Because he himself told it to them. He gave them the wisdom. They sell this stuff the wisdom, the knowledge, as information in self-help books. They make money from it, getting you to believe they have this innate wisdom that they got through study and, and, and thinking and meditating when God says, I gave them the knowledge of how this all works. And they held it in unrighteousness. They take the credit for it. God wants us to use it for a very specific purpose. We just read. That's one of the purposes of God. You know, when, when, when the Lord first started to give me this, he gave it to me because of the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 4. He said he set teachers in the church. And the reason he set the teachers in the church was so that all the members of the church, the body of Christ, would grow. And it says that we would grow to really mature manhood. There was nothing less. You have to go to Ephesians chapter 4 and read this. That's where he's talking about the ministry gifts. He said that the church, oh no, we're going to read this. We're going to read this from Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to see. Now, for some people, this goes too far. But this isn't for people in general. This is for those who have received Jesus as Lord. God said he did these things and he did them for a specific purpose. In Ephesians chapter 4, it's starting in reading in verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ. Now see, there are those that religious people that say, well, you're blaspheming. I didn't write this. I just read it and exposed it to you. Let me read it to you in the Amplified Bible. Verse 13. That if, the it refers to the church, might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge. What are we studying? Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The accurate knowledge of the Son of God that we might arrive at really mature manhood. The completeness of personality. Listen to this. Don't run away from it. Listen to open your ears. Which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ, and the completeness found in him. That's God's goal for the church. That's God's goal for you. That's God's goal for me. That we would grow till we got to a place where we were no less than the fullness of the measure, the stature of Christ. Now, I know there are some that are thinking, that's blasphemous. I can't even say the word right. <laughs> no, it's scripture. And I didn't write your Bible. I don't know what translation you have, but I'm trusting that whatever translation you have 
it's going to still say the same thing, that God wants you to grow till you come to nothing less than the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. He wants us to grow up. And he talks about us when we act retarded. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30, I believe it was last week, how there are those that are willfully ignorant. If you look at the book of Hebrews, what is it, chapter 5, somewhere around verses 12 and 13? It says, for, for when for the time you ought to be teaching others, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the word of God. You want, he, he says, you need to go back to elementary school. The first principles of the word of God. And it says, and have become such that have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's talking about someone that is retarded in their spiritual growth. He says, you used to be eating strong meat, but now you've gone back to where you need baby food and pablum. He has this magnificent glory that he wants to show through us. And here we are running back to where we need to be desiring the sincere milk of the word. He says, why do you get the sincere milk of the word? He said that you might grow thereby. He wants us to grow up, to come to nothing more or less than the fullness of the stature of the measure of our Lord and our Savior. Now, I've gotten myself into this, so I might as well take it a little further. You know, when a child is growing up, it's interesting to watch a child as they grow up. While they're infants, young children, it's always about them. Everything is me, 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 me. It's mine, I, I, I want, I need. And as the child continues to grow and if they develop normally, they start to watch their parents and all of a sudden, they start wanting to do what they see their parents do. Can I help? Can I help you, daddy? Can I do this? Can I do that? This is a person that's growing in a, at a normal rate. And then they get to the place where they want to be independent. They don't want their father and mother telling them anything. I know, I know, I can do. And as they continue to mature, they find out that life is about more than what they know and what they can do. And if they have some wisdom, they go to their parents and ask them, how did you do or can you help me to do? This is a normal growth. But then there also comes a time when if the child continues to mature and grow, they, you will hear them say, can I do that for you, Dad? Can I do that for you, Mom? This is someone that has grown up. And the Word of God is saying, when you should be at that place where you're saying, Father, what can I do so you won't have to do? It's saying, they've gone back to desiring the sincere milk of the Word. Thank God it's not all of them. But it's way too many. And I don't want to be in that group any longer. I have to imagine that at some point I was in that group. I don't want to be in that group. I want to know what my father is doing. And see if there's anything I can do to help him do it. So some of you are in that same position now. You've gotten to the point where, Father, whatever you're doing, use me. Here I am, God, use me. It says, is there any faithful among you? Can you raise your hand and say, here I am, God, use me. Let me show you one other thing that I found. We just saw part of God's purpose, what he is doing, right? In, in chapter three, verse 10. Let me show you what else he's doing. And this is why we're broadcasting right now. This is why we, we, we minister and witness to other people. And we're not going to make this up. I want you to see it in God's word. So you will know your part in this, what God is doing. I'm going to tell you, and then we're going to see it in the scriptures. Is that all right? 
what God is doing is he is building a house. He is building a temple. He is building a holy tabernacle that he is going to live and reign in throughout all of the eternity of eternities. What kind of house would be worthy of the Lord living in? What all would be in that house, in that temple, in that sanctuary? Well, he's building that house in and through you. Now, we're in the book of Ephesians. Go back to chapter 2. And we'll start reading in verse... We're going to re start reading verse 14. For he is our peace, that's our Lord Jesus, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. When you go back and read that in its context, you're going to see he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. There's a wall of partition between us and he's broke down the wall, made us one family called the church. And Verse 15, having abolished, abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, the one that the naysayers want you to follow after, even the law of command, he has abolished this church. He has abolished it. Did I say that or did your Bible say that? He has abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, peace between the Gentiles and the Jews. And that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, that was the Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, that was the Jews, the commonwealth of Israel. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, when? Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, we're talking about the foundation for a building and the cornerstone that the whole building is lined up on in whom all the building, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, for a habitation of God, a place where God is going to reign and rule from and through for all of the eternity of eternities. Is this taking you too far? You guys have to let me know. Give me some feedback. Is this going too far? If it is, we have to contact the Holy Spirit about this. Because Pastor Stewart didn't write any of this. But he's given to have some understanding of it. And he's given to have the courage to share it with you. Because that was God's purpose in seeing that this New Testament was written so that the New Testament church could look at the wonders of our God and what he's done to you in and through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Yes. Does everyone have a purpose on the planet and, and each purpose is different from one from another? Well, the question was, does everyone on the planet have a purpose? And the answer is yes because God is a God of purpose. And he didn't create any throwaways. He didn't create anything that had no purpose and was useless. Everyone has a purpose. Now, we have an overall purpose that we just read about. We have two that we saw. His purpose was to show 
the manifold wisdom that he has to these powers, thrones, principalities. And part of showing that is that he is building in front of them, what did he say? Not just a habitation, but a holy habitation. He said, well, I'm not holy. Yes, you are. You've been made holy. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. You don't have the righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. See, these things, when you put them together, it says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, you are. And you should be teaching others, well, we're going to have to go to the scriptures because I really don't want you to think that we're making up any of this stuff. Go to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 5. This is a scripture that I was quoting earlier. And it's in verse we're going to start reading in verse 11. Well, we'll start reading in verse 10. So you get an idea of how this works and why you don't know about some of these things that I'm sharing with you, although some of you have been saved for years and years. And so where's he getting this stuff from? He's getting it from the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, the one that you hold and cherish. It's in your Bible. Now we're going to start reading in verse 10. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's talking about Jesus called of God. Let's look at verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Who's he writing this to? He's writing it to Hebrew believers. He says, we could tell you a lot about, of, about Melchizedek. But you are not mature enough to hear it. You become hard of hearing. You want to shut your ears down. But he didn't stop there. I just wanted you to see that this is something that is happening in the church. And I don't want to be, and I don't believe you want to be if you're listening to this. One of those that's become hard of hearing. Read on. Verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be what? For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. Teach you again? Have you been taught? Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Which be the very first basic things. These are basic things. These are not the deep thing. We haven't come close to getting into the deep part of God's word. These are the basics. It's like basic training. Let me read that again. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. You become this way. How'd you get there? How'd you go backwards? Got saved and loved with the Lord and still love the Lord. And all of a sudden, everything gets too hard and too complicated. And you were growing in the things of God. And then you started slipping back. And then the law was placed in front of you. And laws are designed to get you to break them. The law was designed to show how sinful man was without God. The law was never given to you so that you would live and to make you right. The law was given to the church to show people how bad sin is and how bad we are without Christ Jesus. The law was never given to make man right. And it never will be. And you're not under the law. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, I believe it is, it says, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, to change the way they think and the way they act. Not the severity, not the rules and regulations and laws or Ten Commandments that make a man do right. When you learn how good your God is, how good the Lord Jesus is, how good the Holy Spirit is, 
That's when you get your life straight. That's what changes your thinking. That's what changes your actions. Not the severity, the punishment. How many of you have heard people say, well, we're just going to party in hell? There's no party going on in hell, but that the fear of hell does not keep them straight. They just say, I'm going to do this anyway. I might go to hell, but I'm going to do it anyway. But when you learn of the good seed, we started off, we didn't read our text scripture today, but it says it's through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ that we escape the corruption that is in the world through the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's through the goodness of God that we escape. It's through the knowledge of his goodness. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Well, let me finish reading this and then we're going to pray and we're going to be dismissed for this evening. Let me finish reading this and then I'll get your question. It says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that you this milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. By reason of use, it's like going to the gym. You have to use the muscles to keep them toned. By reason of use, you have to use your mind to get to the place where you're willing to accept the word of God and let your mind be renewed by the word of God through gaining the knowledge of God and what you're doing right now. Studying God's word. It's okay to study. It's okay to even ask questions of the word. It's okay to ask questions of me. But in the future, we're gonna, you're going to be able to enter your questions and we'll be answering them during the course of the program. But for now, this is as far as we can go because we're running out of time. And I hope you've been, I believe and pray that you've been edified that you've been exhorted and you've been comforted through this teaching because that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to exhort, to build up, and to comfort. And I hope this is a word of exhortation to you and not con condemnation. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> what changes our actions? Confessing our sins or... What changes our actions? Confessing our sins or... What? what I just said changes your actions it's through the knowledge of God if you just go to second Peter and take it to heart if you go to second Peter verses 2 through 4 you'll see it's through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are able to escape the corruption that is in the world through the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life that will change our actions. And during this change, during this, this, this gaining of this knowledge, it says what you're going to learn is that you already have, he has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, not through our actions, but through our knowledge of him and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the word. See, that we look and we can, we can go so far. We can look in the book of Hebrews. We don't have time to go there. But it says, those people refuse to believe the good news of the gospel. So why were they in the wilderness? Why do we have so many of our brothers and sisters going around talking about their having wilderness experiences? It says that we should be where at least any of us should come short of walking in this righteousness and this glory what Jesus purchased for us because we refuse to believe the good news. That's where it says we need to work. We got to work, but the work that we're supposed to do is to labor to enter into his rest. Work at resting. Rest in his word. What you're doing now is known as resting in his word. 
resting in the Word of God. Yes. And one more. Um, you mentioned the natural man. What's the opposite of a natural man? A spirit. What's the opposite of a natural man? The natural man is a man that has a dead spirit. He's flesh, he's soul, and he is spirit, but his spirit is dead. His spirit is spirit. He is spiritually separated from God. That is a natural man. He's working, operating in the natural. A spiritual man is one that has been born again. And his spirit is alive in Christ Jesus. We always want to, that, that's the answer. If you want to hold on to the answer to the question, it's Christ Jesus. Can you do all, I can do all things in Christ. Which strengthens me. Church, it's, it's, we have so much power. It says in the book of Ephesians in the second chapter that we can do abundantly above, infinitely above and beyond all we dare to ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. What is it saying? Can we really do all of these things? Let's take the word and say, I can do everything in it. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now I need to learn what all the things are and how to do all the things. And we have one more question. The ability to do all things, does that take ability or authority? It takes both. He gives us both the ability to do it and the authority to do it. See, we can do how many things? All things. All things. So all things doesn't leave out anything. The, the, the thing that happens is that he is so good. It's That's why it's called gospel. The news that's so good, it's almost too good to be true. It's hard to believe, but it's true. It says you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. It says all things have been given unto us. It says all things, that word all, when you look through the scriptures and you start reading the scriptures, you ought to underline this every time you see all and it's referring to you. How will he not freely give us what? Romans 8.32. All things. How's he going to give it to us? Freely. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. All things. That word all is hooked up with God and with you. It's all through, I mean, it just comes up inside of me. It just starts bubbling up when I think, think about the book, of, what is it, 2 Corinthians? It says, all things are yours, whether life or death, things present, things to come, the universe, all things are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. It uses that word all. It says, don't elevate any man other than the man Christ Jesus because all things are yours and the Apostle Paul when the Holy Spirit had him pen that he said who am I who who is Paul who am I who is who is Peter who is this one or that one he says don't don't get to where you're elevating men why? Why, why shouldn't I elevate me? He has so much or he's done so. He says the reason you don't elevate me or anyone else is because all things are yours. Is this too? I, I just don't want it to go too far over. But let's do this. I know we're out of time. Let's do this. Let's pray. And there might be some that don't know this Jesus that we've been talking about that have just joined in and wondered, what's that guy ranting about? Well, I want you to know I'm ranting about the Lord Jesus who can bless your life in such so many ways that I want you to know him and to get to know him. I want you to receive the salvation that's in him. And you do that not by changing what you're doing but by changing what you're saying and the first thing we want to do that will cause those changes to start taking place is to say what he said 
about salvation. So if you'll just follow after me, I'll lead you in saying these things. It's up to you to believe it, but I can lead it and we can both say it. So just follow after me. God, God I come to you. I come to you. I come to you according to your word. I come to you according to your word. Your word says, your word says in the book of Romans, the book of Romans chapter, 10, chapter 10, verse 9, verse nine that, if I will confess with my mouth, that if I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Lord and, believe in my heart, and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, that, you raised him from the dead, that I, shall be saved. I shall be saved. God, God right, now, right now with my mouth, I confess, I confess that, Jesus that Jesus is Lord, is Lord. and I believe, I believe in my heart, my heart that you raised Jesus, you raised Jesus from, the from the dead. So with my mouth, so with my mouth I've made a confession, confession unto salvation. salvation, and with my heart, with my heart I, have I have believed unto right standing, right standing with, you. with you. For your word says, your word says that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and right now I'm calling on the name of Jesus for my salvation so I thank you father that I shall be saved and I thank you in the name of my Lord my God my Savior and my King Jesus the Christ amen yes do I need to pray this prayer? If you prayed that prayer, the question was, how often do you need to pray that prayer? If you prayed that prayer, believing in your heart that Jesus is alive, that God raised him from the dead, you don't ever have to pray that prayer again. But you can pray that prayer as many times and as often as you want to. But it's only necessary to be prayed once and to be believed once. God will take care of the rest. It's his word, it's his promise. Now, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you will move on the people that have prayed and that you will fill them to overflowing. Give them a new prayer language, Father. Let them know that there is a God in this universe and that you are alive and well and that they are so deeply, deeply loved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, until next time, this is Pastor Stewart saying good night. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus.